Good morning. Believe it or not, we're in week 15 of, of Matthew's Gospel. We're, we're working through the Gospel of Matthew. We're taking a year to do it. And this morning, Jesus is going to focus on freedom. And he's going to do it in three very interesting pictures. And as it turns out, freedom is a very important thing in our lives. I know a lot of us are kind of accustomed to living in a nation that has guaranteed some freedoms for us. But Jesus goes deeper to something other than just a political freedom. And he's talking about a spiritual freedom and how that impacts our lives. And so we're going to take a look at this uh, this morning. It's one thing to, to know you have the right to choose, right? Uh, if you go into a supermarket, there, I don't know how many different kinds of shampoos they have there. I always buy the same one. I like having the choice, but I still always, if they didn't have the one I wanted, that would make me a little annoyed. And we think that freedom is basically the power to decide, to choose. But the truth is, is that there are actually forces that shape manipulate, intimidate, and control our lives. And even when we have the legal right to make a decision, we often fail to do it. And it's because there's an absence of freedom in our lives. And Jesus wants to tackle that. So we're in Matthew chapter nine. So Jesus stepped into a boat, crossed over, came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the man, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, this fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, get up, take your mat, and go home. Then the man got up and went home. And when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God, who had given such authority to man. First freedom. We need to be free from unforgiveness. We need to be free from unforgiveness. It said Jesus got out of the boat. If you remember the last time we talked, he was leaving the city of the Gadarenes where he had done a remarkable act of freedom, a miracle of freedom on two men who were there. They asked him to leave, so he comes back and it says to his own town. There are four basic cities that make up Jesus' life. The first is Bethlehem, that's the place of his birth. The second is Nazareth, that's the place he grew up. The third is Capernaum, and this is the place of mission for him. This is where he lives out, it's kind of the, the central location of the work that he's going to do for the kingdom of God. And then the last city is Jerusalem, and that is where he will be crucified and resurrected. What's interesting is, is Matthew really pairs down this story. Mark gives us a lot more information about how the men actually took this man, climbed up on the roof of a house, dismantled a hole in the roof large enough to be able to lower him down. Matthew's not focused on that part of the story, but he does say something very interesting. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, it doesn't say when Jesus saw his faith. I wish I could tell you that you will always feel like your faith is where it needs to be so that you can always step into everything God intends for your life. But if you've lived longer than a half a minute, you've already discovered that there are things that are discouraging. There are just, just all kinds of frustrating things to work through. There are things that seem overwhelming to us. And sometimes we wonder if it's our fault, if for some reason I'm not able to move forward when other people are. And we can bring a lot of judgment on ourselves. And it's so important to be part of a community because these men, even if this man who was paralyzed didn't seem to have enough faith for himself, they knew if they could get him to Jesus, Jesus would do good things in his life. Aren't you glad you're part of a community of faith? Even when you are down, they can still help bring you into the presence of Jesus. Amen? Amen. So then he says, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. And this 
created quite a bit of controversy with some religious leaders. In fact, all of the controversies, we're going to look at three controversies. And every single controversy involved religious leadership. This, something is changing. Everybody's been thinking Jesus is wonderful through chapter 8 except for the people who own the pigs in chapter 8. <laughs> but now in chapter 9, the religious leaders start having some concerns. And Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And it's easy to jump to some wrong conclusions about this. Uh, some people might assume, well, then all sickness is evidence that the person has sinned, and that's why they're sick. And uh, actually, if you know scripture, Jesus dismantles that thinking. There, there was a, a guy who was blind, and, and the disciples asked, who's responsible for his blindness? Was it his sin or his parents' sin? And, and Jesus just gave them a whole dissertation on how you don't actually know how anything works. Yeah. So that's not what's going on here. He's not saying you have committed a personal sin, and, and that's why there is sickness in anyone's life. But there was something connected to unforgiveness in this man's paralysis. And Jesus is doing a diagnostic here. And before we go too far into the message, I want to say every single one of us know this is true. Because at any point you have felt unforgiven, you know how restrictive that can be in your life. There are places you won't go. There are people you won't talk to. There are things that you won't try. There are open doors you will not walk through. There are closed doors you will not knock on, all because you sense that someone has not forgiven you for something that you have done or you have been unable to forgive yourself. It's unbelievable how paralyzing unforgiveness can be. And every single one of us has known what that feels like. And Jesus wants to deal with that. For unforgiveness paralyzes us. Guilt has a way of just wrapping us up in chains and not allowing us to move forward into the life that God has called us. This is not a new concept. The psalmist would talk about this back in Psalm 32. He would say, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against him, and in whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave me the guilt of my sin. He felt completely like he had no strength. And he was wasting away a kind of paralysis until he brought his sins and openly confessed them to God. And in that forgiveness, he discovered that there was life to be lived. This is very important. Faith constantly struggles to exist where there is unforgiveness. This is why Jesus highlighted this so much and so often in his ministry, and it's why it's so important for us, because if you do not feel forgiven, you will not show up in rooms like this. You will not listen to sermons like this. You will not sing songs like the ones that we sang. You won't want to be around other people of faith because you feel there's something disqualifying in you. Faith needs the oxygen of forgiveness to be able to keep connecting with other people and connecting to God. How many are grateful that God is the ultimate forgiver? Amen? Amen. So, it was, in, it was interesting. Jesus knew their thoughts, and, he, and this is what he said. Why do you entertain evil thoughts? He didn't say, why do you have them? He didn't say, why do you permit them? Why do you tolerate them? Why do you entertain evil thoughts? Why do, you, why do you make evil thoughts feel at home in your life? Why do you find some kind of joy in judgment? Tomorrow night, I will tune in to the Buffalo Bills. That's right. And if they win, I will be entertained. <laughs> and if they lose, I will be something else. <laughs> what is there about the human heart that when we see someone else as less than, as other than, 
We find some kind of joy in that. And we like, to, we like to have that thought more than once. When that thought comes to us, we don't say, I shouldn't think like that. <laughs> Why do we entertain evil thoughts? And Jesus, he goes right after it. He said, I want you to know that the Son of Man, it's his favorite title for himself, that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Which is harder, to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise up and walk? And they're all standing around and looking. And he said, just so you know, I have this authority. He says to the man, get up, to pick up your mat and go home. There's something very empowering about forgiveness. It's amazing the things that you can pick up. And in a way, this concept of forgiveness is what brings us home to God and makes us at home with each other. It's forgiveness. And by the way, just so we, we remind ourselves, forgiveness is not just for unbelievers. Forgiveness is for all of us. We're just a few hours into this brand new year, and some of us have already done something <laughs> we need forgiveness for. And some of us have already failed to do something that we need forgiveness for. Forgiveness from God is available every single day of our lives, and the good news is, is when we embrace it, strength comes into our life. We're able to pick up our mat and we're able to go home into the relationships that God has called us to be a part of in our lives. Second freedom, we need to be free from segregation. Now, what are you talking about? Well, let's look at it. Matthew, the ninth chapter, beginning in verse nine, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Matthew's a tax collector, that's his occupation. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. And while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees, another religious group, saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who needs a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. He's quoting from an Old Testament prophet by the name of Hosea. Chapter 6, if you're interested. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus did not meet Matthew in a synagogue or a temple. And there's a reason for that. Because as a tax collector, he was not permitted in the synagogue or the temple. He was considered on par morally with murderers and thieves. And the reason for that is he was helping to underwrite the cost of a military occupation by Rome and a country that did not want them to be there. He made sure that every citizen and every inhabitant of that town would pay their fair share of taxes so that they could keep the military nation propped up in all of its power and might. People did not like tax collectors at all. And Jesus asked one of these guys to be a follower of him, and he gets up and follows him. Now, the problem is, is that all of Matthew's friends happen to be tax collectors because nobody else will be his friends. And so Jesus winds up having dinner at his house and there's all these tax collectors, all these sinners, all these people are considered out of bounds. And Jesus is having dinner with them and the Pharisees can't stand it because their concept is, is the way you stay good is you stay away from the bad. And they had reasons for that. For example, like Psalm chapter 1, blessed is the one, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that the sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. Aren't you supposed to stay away from people like that? So the question is, who's right? Because Jesus is seriously challenging something that they built their lives around. The, the way you maintain purity is to stay away from anything that you consider impure. 
What kind of example is Jesus sitting, is, is setting? He's in there sitting with tax collectors and sinners and people who have nothing to do with God and not allowed in the synagogues or the temples. And he's spending time with them. Look at them. They're laughing. They're having fun. At, at least he could look uncomfortable. And the Pharisees are completely put off by this. Matthew's the one that invited all of these people. Why? Matthew does his first evangelism by eating with people, not by preaching to people. That's something to think about. We've reduced evangelism to telling how other people how they should live their lives. These are the rules you should probably keep, and these are the verses you should probably know. And when you're willing to do both of those things, you come let me know, and, and we'll make sure we got a seat for you in church. And Matthew has a completely different thought process about this. My, my briefest of conversations with this man is already transforming my life. And he actually gave me hope that I wasn't just stuck in a job trying to prop up a government and, and, and having no friends except the people who are also doing this kind of job. His life is being transformed and he has this idea. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if I could get Jesus into the room with all of my friends who think that they don't have any future either? I wonder what might happen in their lives. And so he invites Jesus and his friends over to share the same table, hoping that what is happening in his life would also happen in their life. Folks, can I tell you something? Maybe evangelism in 2023 will sound less like telling people how to live or how to vote and bringing people into our house to share a seat at the table and saying, you are welcome here. And we think Jesus will really change your life. <laughs> Freedom from segregation. And here's the thing. The minute that we start separating ourselves from other people, we're doing a kind of judgment, aren't we? Yeah, those people. Here's a clue. A serious alarm should go off in your head anytime you use the, word, the words, those people. Because you have segregated yourself in a way that you feel better about yourself and lesser about them. And I think that's incredibly toxic enough. But there's another kind of judgment here that goes on that we don't think about very much. See, as soon as I go, those people, and I don't want to hang around those people, for whatever reason, they voted different than you in the last election. They're older than you. They're younger than you. They're cooler than you. They're uncooler than you. They have kids. They don't have kids. I mean, we have all these reasons to separate ourselves from people. Those people. All right, so now I'm, I'm separate from those people, and somehow they're less. But there's another judgment, and we never calculate. We never do the math on this. And it is far more devastating to us than we could ever imagine. It's a secret code that gets snuck in underneath the... Uh, the surface level of our, our judgment. It's like clicking on an email and have something running in the background system of your operating system of a computer. And, and you feel pretty good. Those, those people, oh, those people. Something else is happening. It got into your heart. And this is, the, this is the code that will absolutely neutralize our capacity to be used by God. At that moment, what I have decided is I don't have anything to offer those people. There's nothing inside of me. There's nothing I can say. There's nothing I can do that will make any difference in those people. And all of a sudden, we see ourselves as less and worthless and powerless and useless and worthless. We, we have all of these things that are less because as soon as I identify those people and if I'm around them, I know I can't change them. Therefore, I think less of me. There's another reason why we want to 
trying to create distance from some people, and that is that they do things that are tempting to us. Um, I don't know what your temptations are, I just know you have them. We do a really good job of hiding the temptations of our heart, the imaginations of our mind. It's easy to do. Even people really close to us might not know. So we can kind of do this thing where we're just, and the reason we don't want to be around some people is because we know we'd be seriously tempted if we got into that company to do things that used to be a part of our life or we've always secretly desired to be a part of our lives. And so what we want to do instead of building strong character that can withstand temptation, we want to eliminate temptation so we don't have to be strong at all. This is a serious problem. There's a temptation to use people instead of serve people. And Jesus, his response is, who needs a doctor? The healthy or the sick? And the answer is obvious. And what Jesus is saying, I'm on mission. This is my mission. I've come for the sinners. I've come for the unrighteous. I've come for those who feel like failures. I've, I've come for them whose lives are all dismantled and broken and, and they're disappointed in themselves and they're disappointed in others and they're disappointed in the world as it exists today. Those are the people that I've come for. I'm on mission. Jesus understands the mission. This is why it's really important because when you understand the mission, now you can serve people instead of using people. Jesus wasn't using anyone to elevate his status. He wasn't using anyone to get him something that he always secretly desired. He wasn't using anyone so that he could experience some kind of pleasure that he was hoping that person could give him so they would feel better about themselves at least for one night. What we call freedom in our culture is often little more than just using people so we feel better. And Jesus isn't there to use anybody. Jesus is there to serve them. It's astonishing. It's stunning. It's breathtaking. It's absolutely, it, it, it reorients our whole way of thinking. That the work that God is doing in my life and the grace that is shed abroad in my heart is not just forgiving me of what I've done, but it's building me into the kind of person who understands that there are other people who are broken and I can be part of the mission of Christ to help them so they don't have to live a broken life for the rest of their life. It's absolutely stunning. He doesn't use people. He serves them. Avoiding bad people does not make us good. It just keeps us from being an influence with the grace of God. Um, now I really have to hurry, and the good news is there's not much to say on the last point, but I'll try. Third, we need to be free from religious guilt. Verse 14, it says, Then John's disciples, it's talking about John the baptizer, came and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast often. Fasting is to go without eating food. But your disciples <laughs> do not fast. And Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and they, then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse, and neither do people pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Both are preserved. If you're not familiar with the concept of fasting, there's actually kind of a health kick about it now, uh, kind of intermittent fasting to make you feel stronger, look better, all that stuff. 
But for most of human history, uh, it's been part of, it's been connected to religious practices. And, and it devolves. It devolves into two things. Some people see fasting as a hunger strike. I, I'm not going to eat until God gives me what I want. God can outlast you. He just smiles and says, I'll see you in about 40 days. <laughs> and, uh, so fasting is not a hunger strike. And then there are other people who turn it into, this kind of this demonstrates the strength of my character. I'm able to master my body. I can tell myself, no Oreo cookies for you. And then I make sure that that happens by getting all of the Oreo cookies out of my house so that others who are not joining me in my fast also are not tempted by what tempts me. It comes all about the strength of my character and the mastery of my body. And here's the problem. We can't get anywhere in God by focusing on ourselves. Fasting is not a way to manipulate God and it's not a way to prove that you're stronger in your faith than other people. If we treat it like that, then we misuse what fasting is. So, Here's a passage of scripture in Isaiah that actually talks about what fasting should be, according to God. And I've used the message translation just to drive the point a little more clear into our hearts. This is the kind of fast day I'm after, to break the chains of injustice, get rid of exploitation in the workplace, free the oppressed, cancel debts. What I'm interested in is seeing, seeing you do is sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill clad, being available to your own families. Do this and the lights will turn on and your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. Then when you pray, God will answer. You will call out for help. I'll say, here I am. This is not focused on self at all. It's not trying to force God to do anything. Fasting is a way to become other-centered, Focus on God and others rather than self. Jesus uses the example. He actually gives three little quick parables. One is a wedding, one is a garment, and one is wine. With the wedding, he said, can you imagine going to a wedding reception and saying, I'm sorry, I, I can't eat? And in the culture of Jesus' day, weddings lasted for a week. And it was feasting all week long. And Jesus would say, that, that's disrespectful. He says, you wouldn't fast there. And then he says, he gives us parables that talk about how old things and new things don't tend to mix well. Old things and new things don't tend to mix well. The old garments and new patches don't go so well. Old wineskins, new wine doesn't work so well together. What is Jesus telling us? If we're going to receive new things from God, we must be renewed by God. That God is not saying the old is all that matters and everybody should just respect that. And God is not saying the new is all that matters and everybody should get on board with that. What God is saying is, in order to keep embracing new things, God's going to have to renew our lives because otherwise we'll just find ourselves fighting against it all of the time. If we're, not, if we're not free, I'll call the worship team up. If we're not free from unforgiveness, we're going to wind up paralyzed, not able to go into the places that God has prepared for us in life, the kind of life that he wants us to live. If we're not free from segregation, we're going to be neutralized. We're called here on mission. And that's to allow the grace of God to be as contagious as possible in a culture that knows less and less about grace all the time. And if we're not free from religious guilt, we'll be marginalized. We fast often. These are the rules we keep. These are our practices. 
Have you ever had somebody say that? Yeah. Well, how many, how many chapters of the Bible do you read a day? How many minutes do you spend in prayer every day? How many church services have you attended this year? All of you can say every one of them. <laughs> I've not missed a single service this year. It's, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible way to live. Because there'll always be someone who reads more scripture than I do and prays more words than I do and shows up in more religious environments than I do and does more good deeds than I do. And, and all I have to do is have that call to my attention. And I'm marginalized. Why would God use me? There's other people who doing a lot better job. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what area you need freedom in. Could be all three. But you are paralyzed because of unforgiveness. Highly likely that it's forgiveness of yourself, but can also be forgiveness of others. And what I want you to know is that there is one who can forgive you completely and fully and totally and for all time. And you should find out what it's like to be able to get up and carry your mat and go into the kind of relationships that God has intended for you to have. You're missing out. You're paralyzed. And Jesus has come to do something about that. This would be a great way to start a year. Or maybe it's your model of spirituality is to keep getting into a holier, holier huddle until finally it's just going to be a very few people who feel very good about themselves and not very good about anybody else. But the problem is, is that nothing in the world changes when we're hiding. And, and then maybe you just feel inferior because you're constantly surrounded by people who seem to do more than you do. There's freedom from all of that. And I can't imagine a better way to start 2023 than freedom. Would you bow your heads with me? Uh, Father, we do struggle with unforgiveness. We do struggle with judgmentalism. We do struggle with inferiority and it limits our lives in ways that we can't imagine. And you wouldn't ignore any of those things. You insisted on calling all of them to our attention. And you've told us and showed us in multiple ways, you have the authority. You have the authority to forgive all of our sins. You have that authority and you're using it today. You have the capacity to place us in rooms, not because we're comfortable there, but because your heart for the people who are in that room is greater than our discomfort. And you have the capacity where it's not a competition about who can do more than someone else, but it's just simply an, an ability to be around others and enjoy what you are doing. The bridegroom is with us and we're going to enjoy everything he has for us. Would you grant us all of those freedoms today? In the name of your strong son, Jesus, amen. Let's all stand together.